Patina Tato, Ke Namarai, Namana Finua, Na Hapu, Na Iwi, Otira Kia Kota Kato, Koi Hui Hui Mai I Tipo, and Tina Kato. Mitima Tatine Huyata, Itikarakia. I mean, we tato Fakataka te ho ki te uru, Fakataka te ho ki te tonga, Kia ma kina kina ki uta, Kia ma tara tara ki tai, E hia ki ana te ata kura, He teo, he hoka, he ho hu, Ti hei mauri ora. Tēnā koutou katoa, nau mai haruma i tēnei wānanga, i tēnei hui, Ko Waiau, huiri a hau nō Taupere, hoia te waka o Tainui, ripo ripo riri ana te wai o Waikato, huiri a hau nō te whānau o Te Amo, ko kei te Te Amo a hau. Kia ora, great to see you all virtually. I'm Katie Te Amo, Head of Strategy and Insights at Taumata Arawai, and I'll be facilitating uh, our hui tonight. And I'd like to welcome all the whānau from across the motu to our third online webinar to engage with whānau across the motu. Um, firstly, just our apologies for uh, postponing uh, this hui by a couple of weeks um, due to a number of our team uh, being ma wiwi and um, having um, illnesses. Um, and as we've noted in previous webinar, um, ideally we'd like to be doing this um, out in the rohe, kanohi ki te kanohi. Um, unfortunately, we're still living through um, the disruption that COVID-19 is creating for us. Um, but we adapt and I'm sure we're all very familiar with this type of um, format. Kia ha te kai o rangatira. He kōrero, he kōrero, he kōrero. Uh, this whakatauke, which I'm sure will be familiar to many of you, um, has helped shape, helped develop uh, the way that we have planned uh, the webinar for tonight. And I'm so pleased uh, that we are joined by Rangatira, uh, that we have Matua Guy and Fai Teresa um, from Rupunga um, beaming in with us alongside Rokurahuata. Um, and that you'll be able to hear directly from a community water supply and not just from us, a Taumataroa, the water services regulator. Uh, Imihi ana kia kōroa. Um, quickly, I'll just, uh, as you see on the screen in front of you, um, in terms of the agenda, um, I'll quickly recap on the previous two webinar uh, and then lead into a corridor, and then I'll hand over shortly um, to those coming in from Wairua. Um, we've had our first webinar uh, of this type, of this kind, in December last year, and that was to really introduce uh, ourselves as the water services regulator. Um, starting uh, at the beginning of our journey um, and talking about our desire to listen and engage with Fano, hapu and iwi. Um, that first webinar we were joined by the Minister responsible for Taumata Aroa, so the Honourable Nanaya Mahuta, our Board Chair Dan Karen Patasi and our Tipuna Chair um, Tipa Mahuta. We then had our second webinar in February this year and that's when we started to share a bit more about the engagements we were um, having at that point uh, with our Māori water supplies. Um, we talked about the roadmap uh, for registered and unregistered water supplies. And we were joined by Peter Wood, um, and that was, I guess, an early introduction in this forum um, to the Raupunga water supply. Which leads us uh, to this evening, where, as I've said, we're very fortunate to be joined by Guy Taylor and Teresa Thornton, who operate the Raupunga water supply. And they'll call it all and we'll spend most of the time tonight uh, with them. Um, the previous webinar we do have on our website uh, and in the chat function, we'll post a link to, to those webinars. Um, in that link, it also shares um, any upcoming, upcoming webinar that we have available as well. Um, I'm pretty sure that we're all very familiar with the webinar tikanga, 
um, and that you've all um, come in into this way and that um, if you have any parts out, any questions at all, please do just enter them into the chat function anytime. You don't need to wait till any point in the webinar. Just put those parts I through as they come up for you. Uh, quickly, before I uh, hand over to Rokura Matua Guy and Fire Teresa, i uh, just do a really quick introduction to Taumata Arawai for those of you who may be meeting us for the first time. So Taumata Arawai, we are the Water Services Regulator. Uh, we came into existence uh, March last year, 2021, and we uh, assumed or uh, regulatory responsibility for drinking water uh, on the 15th of November last year. Uh, as you see on the screen there, um, really in a snapshot, you get a sense of our, our functions, our role and our way of being. Um, and you'll be able to see that everything um, on the screen is very much driven uh, by te mano o te wai. So from our po through to our, our tikanga, our ways of working and our whakatauke. Uh, we are currently working with uh, registered drinking water suppliers um, and we've been very privileged, as I said, uh, to have uh, started our relationship with Raupunga Water Supply, um, who we'll hear from more uh, very soon. Um, on that, I'll actually start to uh, hand over to Rokura Huata, um, who's going to give a bit of an introduction into the mahi that she's been leading uh, for Taumata Arawai, um, working with uh, our kāinga, so our marae, our kurako papa and kōhunga reo. Um, and so without further ado, I will hand over to you, Ehoa, Rokura, who's in the room in Wairoa with Guy and Teresa. Ko ta where rangi te maunga, ko mohaka te aua, ko kahu o te rangi te tangata. Ko kwaike a te tanifa, harara taupunga o punga, tiki hiru harama, ga urupa. Ko rongo mai wahine, te whare poro titi, Ko ngā tipa hau e rā te iwi e. I didn't even practice that. E a kunui, e a kuranga tira tēnā tātou katoa, ko rau kura hua tātou ku enua, he kai mahi a hau i roto i te tīma a Katie, Principal Advisor in the Strategy and Insights team, and kei kōna iau. Darling in from Te Pito Te Ao, from the Centre of the Universe, Kahunganu ki Wairoa, E kaha pupuhi ana ngā haora a tāwhiri mātea. Now, while those winds are haora, that doesn't make for a very comfortable plane ride from Wellington to Napier. Uh, hoia noko tai, ora mai mātou, uh, ki tēnei whare whakaruru hau, uh, ngā te pā hauera. <clears throat> now, in this wahanga of our webinar, I'll update you on our engagement with Māori water suppliers uh, before I then hand over the rako kōrero to the operators of the Raupunga Community Water Supply, ke takutaha. Uh, who will share their journey supplying safe drinking water uh, to their whānau and to the wider hapuri of Raupunga. Now, I believe we have some slides. Oh, fine. So, <clears throat> the kind of engagement stream, it's, it is uh, connecting with Māori suppliers. Um, now, we have prioritised uh, kāinga who were registered with the Ministry of Health before uh, the 15th, uh, sorry, we are connecting uh, with Kainga, who were registered uh, with the Ministry of Health before the 15th of November uh, last year. And uh, in the group of Māori suppliers, we have labelled this workstream Kainga, uh, who are made up of a combination of mixed iwi entities, Kura Kaupapa Māori, Kohanga Reo, Marae, Papa Kainga, um, and in the case of Raupunga, densely populated Māori communities um, who are registered to, registered to supply uh, safe drinking water. 
and the focus of this particular work stream has been migrating their details from the Ministry of Health uh, portal into the Taumata Arawai online portal, Hine Kōrako. Um, I think more specifically, so we have a dedicated team at Taumata Arawai. Uh, there are five of us in the team who are connecting with iwi and where possible, the likes of Ngaitahu and Tainui are doing their own uh, iwi to iwi engagement. Uh, go next. Uh, uh, next slide. It's not clicking on mine. Oh, come on. Uh, <clears throat> and so in our in our engagement, uh, as you can imagine, uh, there have been a number of concerns that have um, been raised by our hapuri uh, to our kainga engagement team. And I won't go through them line by line, but the two greatest uh, concerns for uh, our whānau, our, our kainga, um, uh, so having uh, dealt with the Ministry of Health previously, now with Taumata Arawai, what are the changes? So what actually are required of kāinga uh, to be compliant? And then of course, the biggest uh, concern that we hear is the cost of becoming compliant. Uh, if you have any pātai, then I'm happy to answer um, the list of uh, concerns that registered kāinga want to know more about us. If you want to know anything more specifically, then we can leave that to the uh, question and answer section. Um, but without further ado, um, kei taku taha uh, the Māngai Wai for Ngāti Pāhau Wera Development Trust, Matua Guy Taylor and Fire Trees in Thornton, who also operate the Raupunga Community Water Supply. Now, we practiced this earlier, so I'm going to go on mute now, and then ka hoa tu te rākau kōrero, uh, ki ene kai whakahaere. Kia ora koutou katoa, I'll start from the beginning I suppose for our community. Um, back in 2007, uh, Ministry of Health had some funding available for small drinking water supplies. Um, we've always had our own drinking water supply. Um, when the railways, uh, when they built the um, viaduct, they left the water supply to the community. It was over 100 years ago, and um, they used that water supply to um, to feed the steam trains, and um, then it was passed on to our community. And as a community, we looked after that system. It cost us nothing. Um, our farmer, every time it broke down, they'll go up and clean the wear out. It was, I don't know, 10 k's across the paddock, and um, they'll clean the wear out and just fix up the pipeline. The pipeline become heavily corroded, and. Um, We've always, you know, we've never had to pay for water, and we didn't want to pay for water either. All we wanted to do originally was to um, replace that pipeline, um, and uh, yeah. So when that system went, um, we had to find something for our community because um, we're 100% Māori community, and. Um, and a lot of the whānau homes around our mutu, uh, they have small roof space, they have um, small tanks, and there wasn't a lot of water. They, they couldn't collect any water during the um, summertime, and um, yeah, so we had to find a water supply. We, um, gee, we went through about seven engineers, believe it or not. We've dedicated our um, water supply to um, somebody who really instilled in us to fight for what we believe in, which we did, and to keep the supply that we have. He said, we've got the better, best water supplies in New Zealand because we all our water, um, can't, we're gravity fed and that's what we wanted. We wanted a sustainable system that we could look after and that we could, um, yeah, for us it was, the, it was about the cost, the cost of the system. And, um, we were lucky enough to 
I don't know how we've done it, looking back on it, but um, because originally Yanni needed uh, needed to find 5% of the funding uh, by the time we finished, because we started this journey in 2007, our system got built in 2017. So we had to find over half of that funding to, um, to build this system. Uh, but we persevered, we ended up having to, Ministry of Health would only uh, fund half of it, we had to find the other half. So uh, we found the other half and um, we've just found ourselves uh, tweaking it, I suppose. Scott mm. Guy here is the expert on um, the technical side of it. Mm. Oh, thank you. Oh, he's our technical person. And he's my technical. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, guys, guys kind of run our system. Well, it was all about, we've all done it for, for nothing, really. It's been the community spirit, I suppose, uh, because we have a low income earning fund, you know, it's mostly beneficiaries and seasonal workers so um, yeah it was important for us to for uh, when we had the DHB Ministry of Health come into our community um, we wanted we didn't want them to tell us what you know what we should have we we knew what we wanted and that's what we stuck with we stuck to our gravity system because that was the most sustainable for us mm. 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 Mm -hmm. Can I agree, Oh, okay. Um, <clears throat> hi, uh, kia ora Before I start, I just want to acknowledge some people who, uh, without them, uh, we probably wouldn't be sitting here. And as I said to the two people either side of me, who would have thought five years ago we'd be doing this? So it is an honour. Um, I'm still not sure um, that we deserve it, but uh, thank you for the opportunity. So first of all, I just want to acknowledge Teresa. She's been our uh, mana wahini through the whole thing. The 10 year, now going on 15 year journey. Uh, and the person on my right here, Lee Aiken, he, he was, uh, once we got it started, we realized we didn't know what we were doing. So we had to find someone who did. And uh, he's been our, uh, our uh, project manager, our, um, expert advice and I think uh, Theresa without Lee yeah, we, we, would, have done, we wouldn't have got have it. It was this. very complex so mm. um, to both of them you know a huge thanks and one of the reasons I'm here today um, talking so uh, yeah, can we right. and Rata yeah mm. and we must re remember Rata Pui uh, when we were first involved with the Ministry of Health they came with an idea of what they wanted us to do mm. Um, being part of widow, we immediately got upset about that and um, started sort of saying no. Uh, but we weren't getting anywhere until Ratapui, I don't know, some of you might uh, might know him. Um, uh, he came all the way several times from New Plymouth uh, at no cost. And he, through a series of community who he's helped us formulate our plan, mm. which we then presented to the Ministry of Health. And um, yeah, unfortunately, Rata, um, just before we got everything approved, Rata died on his, in a tractor accident on his beloved Parihaka, mm -hmm. uh, but we always remember him. Kia ora. Right. Slideshow? Slideshow. Okay, so Raupunga, um, yeah, Raupunga, is, like many rural communities, has seen better days. We used to have two shops, uh, post office, full employment, um, you know, this was back in the 80s school. We had a Māori district high school. Uh, but yeah, uh, sadly, with the decline in uh, rural prosperity, we, uh, as Teresa has indicated, you know, we, we are a struggling community, not a lot of money around. Um, uh, so what we can, uh, what we can do, we have to do uh, with, you know, limited, um, limited resources. Yeah, yeah, and a lot of aroha, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, it's got there. Yeah, obviously, uh, uh, it's located in Rotonga. We supply around about 250 people, I think, with people coming back now. Mm -hmm. One of the reasons being the water is uh, is because of water. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah. So this is our 
uh, distribution network. Um, uh, the village you see down there with the uh, more densely populated, then we have sort of rural houses running up towards the river source. Uh, the stream source is about five kilometres from the village itself, um, sits 100 metres above the village. So one of the benefits of the gravity system is we don't need to pump anything down and uh, the pressure at the bottom uh, of a 100 metre drop is, is substantial and makes a huge difference to everything you do from washing to cleaning to all sorts of things. So next slide, please. Yeah, so <clears throat> we supply uh, roughly 50 houses there. Um, don't worry about the level two, level three. This is how high they are up from the from the river. Uh, we have uh, Komatua Flats, two Kohana Reo, and the Marae. Um, the Marae is very reliant on us. They have a rainwater supply, but um, uh, often by, say, day two of a hui there, they're kicked into our system. So it's critical that we keep going, you know, for, for all sorts of reasons. Yeah, next slide, please. When we first started, we looked at five different options. Um, yeah, I won't bore you with all this. They're all very large numbers at the top there, um, but all are much around the same figure, and we ended up going with option C which was the Manga Farangi stream. Yep. Okay, this is where we started. We found that a concrete wall in the middle of the Manga Farangi stream and we said, that's us. So, <laughs> so we started from there. Next slide, please. And that's, yeah, that's what it looked like. We got, no one really knows how old it is or who built it, but uh, God bless them. So we had a bit of work to do. And, uh, yep, next. Yep, so we started making add-ons to it to try and make it look uh, more functional. And then we ended up uh, putting a whole lot of, uh, yeah, and that's what it looks like now. So that's our source water, okay? That chamber on the, on the left-hand side is where we pump the water out. And uh, you can't see it too clearly there, but we have a little mesh screen in the front we affectionately call the hinaki. Uh, yep, yep, so that's a better view of, of the, the system. Looks very peaceful there, we'll show you some photos later to show how uh, looks can be deceiving. Okay, um, there was a fair bit of pipeline, as I said, it's five kilometres uh, at least from that water source to the village. And I think Lee, we ended up with nine kilometres, nine, yeah. nine having to lay nine kilometres. We'll just keep cycling on nine kilometres of pipe. Yep. And uh, always someone leaning on a spade. We we're just talking about this chap today. Yeah, God bless him. Yeah, so it's quite a bit of work, eh? You know, we had to have road traffic management systems and all sorts of things. And uh, but we're lucky to avail ourselves of some. Uh, very skilled labour. Sometimes quite difficult to work with, but uh, very skilled. Yeah, thank you. Okay, so we got to, uh, that's our treatment plant there. It's about the size of a small bedroom. Um, yeah, all our uh, uh, filtration systems and that are located inside there. Yep, yeah, we'll go on. We won't spend too much time on it. That's our, what we call the tank farm. So we have 10, 30,000 litre tanks up there, uh, two for settling the, the, um, the water from the stream and eight for storage. And anyone thinking of buying tanks, you buy a 30,000 litre tank, they will only ever store 24,000 litres. And that came to bite us later on as well, because when we first started, we only had the four tanks, four storage tanks. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, this is our, so I'll just run through our filtration system. These are two sand filters, which take the water from the settling plants initially, and then they, it, it runs out. And again, this is all gravity fed, because the tanks are 20 meters higher than the treatment plant, so we can push the water through these sand filters and into a tank, which sits beside the treatment plant. And then after that, they go through what are called media filters. I've no idea why. But um, these ones work down to about five micron, 
And those two sets of uh, filters are back washable. So we have control systems in the treatment plant which detect when the, the filters need back washing and that happens automatically. Then after those, uh, that little cylinder on stainless steel cylinder on the left is the last cartridge set of cartridge filters. We use one micron nominal. Um, we've tried the one micron absolute, but we just can't uh, get any leeway out of them. They don't last long. And uh, to use them would make a huge difference to our costs. We then put them through UV filters. And then as it leaves the treatment plant, uh, the water is chlorinated and then pumped back up to the um, storage tanks. Okay, um, for data, we just use a, a Google Drive setup um, where we can keep all our readings, our chlorine levels, um, you know, different uh, um, criteria that we need to meet, pressures on some of the gauges and the thing, but it's all there for us to go back and just have an audit trail of where we, uh, you know, pretty much um, are going with our, our treatment of the water and that we're meeting certain requirements. So that stuff can all be shared with anyone. Uh, the next thing we have, a, and this wasn't included in the original design, we have an online control system, real-time monitoring, so we can monitor the levels of our tanks and because you can't tell from five kilometers away how much water you've got in your tanks um, and where it's all going and when you need to pump again so this thing can be as accessible for a phone a computer uh, it sends out various alerts like if your uvs have faulted and then the pumps can actually be turned down uh, so you can turned off rather so you can go and um, investigate the cause of those things so that has been a godsend. Uh, I don't know how we, we did manage for oh, about a year without it. And, uh, you know, it was like you'd have to visit the place three times a day just to make sure you hadn't run out of water. Yeah, so that, that's been great. Uh, some of the improvements we've made when we first started, we operated manually. And uh, you'll see why that's not such a good idea shortly. Um, our first 12 months were a total disaster. We shut down after nine months through equipment failure and um, all sorts of things. It took us about another three months to get back on our, on our feet and start again. So first thing we did was turn off automatic operation of the plant. By automatic, I mean when the water levels in the tanks dropped to a certain level, um, it would, the system would start pumping regardless of the condition of the stream. We also realized we didn't have enough storage, so we doubled that capacity. Um, uh, we installed the HALO uh, monitoring system. Um, and thankfully, all those big prices there, we didn't have to pay for any of it. Uh, the HALO monitoring system, the local council funded that. Um, the storage capacity was funded by our um, so Iwi Authority, Ngāti Pahawera Development. Uh, the improved access to the site was funded by Waka Kotahi with great input from Lee. And we put in additional flow meters into the system because our biggest uh, weakness is probably is, is leakage. And that's not leakage in the pipework, that's people leaving taps on. Mm -hmm. uh, just a, a toilet left, because uh, of the pressures involved, a running toilet can run through 20,000 litres a day. So that has to be really um, monitored. And again, with our friends from the Warra District Council, we have um, uh, replaced our analog water meters with electronic meters. Basically meaning you could just drive past and they'll alert you to any leaks or anything like that and water usage. Um, yeah, so that's about where we are. This is, um, I like to say our water source is a perfect storm. So we have things like this happen. Uh, regularly. And there you can see the pumping chamber rapidly will fill up with uh, with silt. And uh, that's probably enough of that. We can just look at the next one. Speaking of silt, 
So where I'm standing there, I should be waist deep in water. Uh, if I walk across to the middle, I should be chest deep in water, but that's about as deep as, it, after a heavy rainfall, that's about as deep as it gets. Um, we've learned to work out how to manage it. Um, you'll see that orange handle shovel again very shortly in the next slide. Uh, yeah, so this is what you have to do. You have to keep the outlet and the weir open so that you don't get such a, a heavy silt build-up. It's not perfect, but it's the um, it's the only uh, method we can think of. And it, it does work in a funny sort of way. So obviously when our system's like that, we're not pumping. Uh, we have had occasions of two weeks without pumping, being able to pump water because of the conditions of the water, of the stream. Uh, and we've managed to get through by uh, the skin of our teeth and not run out of water. So the last thing you want is um, nine kilometres of pipeline uh, emptying out. So where are we up to now? Okay, just a brief summary. So yeah, the system operates manually and that you, uh, you'll go up there, you'll check the state of the stream. It generally got something to do with a blue sky above you and a nice sunny day and um, we pump once a week. We our, The cost to our whānau, I know our goal had been to have free water, but uh, we do have to charge them. So we charge a dollar a day per household. Um, and that just covers the cost of our uh, our operation. So that's good. We supply eight to 10 million litres of treated water annually. Uh, our testing is E. coli, and coliforms in the distribution. We do that monthly. We test chlorine levels weekly. Uh, yes, operating costs us around 12 to 15. Sometimes we're a bit short. Um, uh, never have too much. And yeah, there's just those other things, the online platform, these are things that we put in uh, to record data and real-time monitoring and electronic water meters installed recently. So um, yeah, next the next thing we have to do is look at um, compliance. Under this was built under the old standards, and uh, Havelock happened half what halfway through the build, and so we had to make some adjustments there, and we're going to have to make adjustments again, which is you know we're used to that. Yeah, mm -hmm. is that the last slide? I think so. I've got nine more. Nine more? No. No, that's it. Yeah. So go, just going ahead, um, you know, when I said our water is a perfect storm, uh, the things we need to look at as far as compliance is um, turbidity factors, we believe, and um, what drives that is a high iron and um, colour content in the water. So we can't meet the turbidity um, requirements under the new compliance unless we do something about that that uh, iron content and colour content because it also affects our chlorine retention which would fail under the uh, new standards as well so by just going back and pre-treating the water we're working with the company at the moment uh, to look at how we can do that so for us that's probably our biggest challenge at the moment is to tidy up our water before we treat it and um, we're quite confident everything will fall into place after that and as far as um, complying with the new standards. Uh, can you pass us that please? Okay. Thank you. And we do have a water safety plan. Um, I have to thank uh, Cameron Ormsby from, as he came in as we came, you know, Teresa talked about the capital assistance uh, funding. There's also a technical assistance funding and things like this. So we're about to register that with Taumata Arawai. Um, anyone who'd like a copy of this, um, I think it's quite um, it's quite comprehensive. Uh, you know, it may be useful to someone. I'd be, we'd be happy to share it with anyone who needed it or wanted to have a look at it and see what what's involved. I know Taumata Arawai are putting up um, uh, templates. Yeah. Um, Oh, just a word of caution, it hasn't actually been approved either. <laughs> <laughs> I think Peter Woods turned it down a couple of times. <laughs> but it's close. Yeah. Um, yeah. Anything you want to say quickly? Oh, I, I, thanks, Guy. Kia ora, everyone. Um, 
Yeah, I come right at the end, at the um, point where we wanted to get this physical works going. And Teresa and Guy and Charlie and Vilma, they only really had 600,000 to build this scheme, which I budgeted and needed closer to a million. It actually came out at 9.30, although we did have a, we left off a couple of uh, uh, things that we didn't feel that were that necessary to get this project across the line. We were very fortunate to have a really good team to do it. And we met regularly and we were basically short about 300,000, but um, to Puna Kōkiri, um, some of the gaming trusts, etc., came aboard mm. with it. And we got this project, as I said, across the line. Guy has said in one of his slides, that one there, that he's running it for 12 to 15K per annum. I don't know how he's doing that, because I, I, I uh, did my numbers were closer to 30,000, and that was just the operating cost. The biggest concern I have for this scheme going forward, guys, is that we aren't funding depreciation. And that's enough from Lee. Okay. <laughs> So anyway, that's how I just have to get across the line and uh, we're doing a little bit of work to try and keep some money going in there. We actually have a quarry business in the oh, area, yes. we're pulling metal out of the river and what we do there is we make sure that the, the community water scheme benefits from the river that's extracted out of the Awa and to the extent that that's returning between 12 and 15k um, for guys' efforts to keep the scheme running compliantly. So yeah, I, I could go on and on, but um, I think Guy's given you a fair rendition of it, but yeah, I do have concerns about depreciation. I know Guy's gonna say, shut up, Lee. <laughs> but, well, we run it on the smell of oily rain. Well, eh? we're running it on a um, expense basis, really. I just, just in finishing, I do remember Lee came to me with this crazy plan that, um, this family that has access to the Moaka River and he was going to extract gravel on, on their behalf and pay them, that they would be happy to pay a royalty to our water supply. And these people aren't even on our water supply. And they agreed. So, yeah, so they take so much, you know, and um, the difference that between what they take for per cubic metre and what we take per cubic metre is not great. And uh, to me, that's manaki tanga, um, you know, uh, at its greatest. And uh, I did think it was a crazy idea when he brought it, but he said, well, this, if we did this, we could actually supply free drinking water to Rauponga because, as he said, 12 to 15, and by coincidence, that's what our operating costs are. Yeah, minus, a bit what's that other word, depreciation? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know if you're taking much um, um, benefit from all the work that you put in there, Guy, but I, yeah. I, as, I say, as I said earlier, it, it is really closer to 30K, but if it wasn't for all the volunteer labour that Guy and Teresa regularly put in here, and they call on me every now and then for the last few years, and I'm gladly helping out, but uh, those costs, um, we get across the line because they're very much volunteered. Car mm. point. Mm. Hi. Tina. Hi. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Tina, Really wonderful pathway that have come through the chat, which we'll come to after Papa Ray. But um, I, I know I can um, share these mihi of. A deep, deep aroha to you. Um, three, <clears throat> for not only the uh, investment, time investment, um, and no doubt emotional investment um, that goes into supplying water to your whānau and wider hapuri of Raupunga. Nā reira, koi nei ngā mihi rauaroha mai te whānau uh, o te taumata arawai, ka mutu uh, o ngā uh, kaiwhakarongo, ko hono mai ki tēnei uh, wānangai te pō nei. Uh, Katie, I'll pass back to you. Tēnā koe raukura, tēnā tātou anō. Um, agree. Um, 
cannot echo enough uh, the sentiments of Rokura um, and those clear messages coming through in terms of the uh, investment time and emotionally wise. Um, running off the smell of an oily rag, I think quite a few of our whānau in the chat have picked up on that and you already have lots of uh, whānau um, putting their hands up uh, to your offer of sharing um, your draft drinking water safety plan. Um, and you also have uh, some fellow uh, water suppliers um, from Te Tai Tokiro, from uh, Hokianga, from the far north, um, who are quite keen to learn more from um, Raupanga. And so, um, Namahi Nui, uh, thank you so much for sharing uh, your kōrero. And I'm going to um, hand over shortly. Um, we'll come back to questions, as I said, or as Raupanga said. Um, there's a couple of specific questions, uh, Matua Guy, just around the number of households um, that you supply. But um, we'll hear from Ray and then I'll facilitate sort of the questions that are coming through the chat. So, ka, ka a koe, Ray. Kia ora, Katie. Uh, ngā hau e whā o te mutu, ngā mihi o te pōki a koutou. Uh, ngā mihi nui, ngā mihi mahana. Uh, um, ko aia, no, no ko te rāno o kutipuna, uh, i tipu a ki a hau te manurewa o tama pāhori, uh, ki rāro te mārua e i te iwi o te wai o hua, uh, engari ki wainui e mata a hau e noho ana, uh, ko McMillan te whānau, uh, ki te mātua mana whakahaere waituri o tau mata aroai. Uh, kia ora, good evening, Ray McMillan, Head of Regulatory here at tau mata aroai. Um, geez, I was really wrapped up in that quarter also, so thank you, uh, thank you, um, Theresa Lee and uh, and Guy for for that. Um, one of the things I, I want to say, um, or two things actually. One is we don't approve drinking water safety plans anymore. So um, you send that plan and we'll have a look and really we get into a corridor about how we can make things work and better, right? So we're there to um, support um, communities to provide safe drinking water. Um, but also the the reforms um, are about safe drinking water. To every for everybody every day, right? And then certainly that's the vision here at Te Matarawai. And the purpose of um, the Water Services Act is really to allow people who are in situations like Raupunga where they've done a lot of work and they're providing their communities with safe drinking water, um, is to enable that to continue to happen. Um, and it's Te Matarawai's responsibility to find a way um, to reflect that good work so that you can continue to do what you do um, and that uh, the requirements we put in place uh, are sensible, they work, but they they also uh, enable you to keep doing what you're doing as well. So we're still in the process of, of that corridor with you. Um, we're still searching um, to, to find a way and I guess one of the, the big things is uh, when we took over as the regulator, we didn't know really what the, the landscape was, um, particularly below council supplies into, into communities like uh, now we're finding out more and we're finding out there's a lot more work to do and um, we need to work harder. So um, so this is this is you know brilliant in terms of the work that you're doing. Um, but um, yeah, it certainly tells us that there's a lot lot for us to learn as the, as the regulator as well. So uh, kia ora, thank you for that kōrero. Um, I'm going to get through this um, bit of the presentation really quickly because I know there's a few questions there and I think um, um, I'd be really keen for you to uh, engage um, and get those questions answered from um, Guy and the team uh, in uh, Wairua. So um, just a, a brief summary, I guess, on, on consultation. So we went out to consult from 17th of January, 28th of March, seven documents, um, and these are really the first foundation set of documents for uh, the revised or the new regulatory framework. So we um, split the drinking water standards and the quality assurance rules um, so that they're separate now. It gives us a little bit of flexibility as a regulator to be a little bit more responsive. I um, mean, I think it also um, means that um, for, for a supplier, um, meeting the drinking water standard is not necessarily tied to um, the quality assurance rule. So hopefully um, that, that works um, for the industry as well as allowing us to be a bit more agile and responsive. The other thing we um, went to consultation on was the drinking water aesthetic values. Um, they've uh, been published now um, alongside the drinking water standards um, and I think they were published um, last week and they'll come into effect I think in 28 days time there's a there's a period of time that we need to wait for for those to come into into force. Um, the other three um, uh, documents we consulted on with drinking water acceptable solutions and those were for roof water supplies, spring and bore water supplies, agricultural um, water supplies and what these are, are ready-made solutions that if you 
take that acceptable solution, you implement it, then you're um, you're considered to be compliant as long as you continue um, to remain to continue to implement um, that acceptable solution. It also means you don't have to do drinking water safety plans, um, and uh, and allows you, I guess, uh, a, a, an easy avenue for compliance. Um, they don't work for everyone, um, so not everyone can can use them, but they're an option there um, that didn't exist before. And what we have is the ability to produce more of those acceptable solutions as we understand, um, I guess, what's ha happening out there in the drinking water sector. The other thing we um, we consulted on was a discussion document about network environmental performance measures, and these are measures about how the network distribute or the distribution systems for water supplies are performing. Um, and very much this is us giving uh, effect to Tamanu or Te Wai and some of the, the thinking and, and what we're implementing. So if we um, think about looking after our water at the source and the quality of the water there, and we think about how we treat that water, um, to, to clean it up through the treatment process. But then once it leaves the treatment plant, how are we looking after that water so that we know it gets to, to where we need it to go without wasting it um, and to making sure that that water remains safe for people to drink. So um, it's the kind of that full um, water supply life cycle. And this is the first time that's happened in New Zealand. Um, and, and so we're really, really excited that we can we can look at the network performance. Um, we're certainly um, keen to see, um, see how that evolves and the information we get from that going forward. But as I said, um, you know, there's still a, a lot for us to learn. So um, we'll be in touch. Um, there's only a small team here at Tomata Arawa and we'll get out uh, and around um, and coordinate with as many people as we can, but it will take us some time. Uh, so if we get to submissions received, um, specifically from Māori organisations, we received 11. Um, and these are the, the common themes that were um, were shared across those 11 submissions. So one was um, the unique nature of each marae and thinking about, um, I guess, the role it plays within its community and then how does the, the water supply support that in a way um, which um, reflects, I guess, those those values of, of um, each marae and each community. Uh, compliance requirements, we've already heard a little bit about that, the ongoing um, requirements to meet the, the standards and the accept, uh, the uh, quality assurance rules. Um, we're looking at that and we understand that, um, you know, there's some challenges there uh, for, for everybody uh, right across the board, um, but also um, making sure that our guidance reflects um, the, um, the way in which marae use water and I guess um, you know, applied their tikanga um, to, to their systems and their processes within their community um, and making sure that um, whatever we've got is makes sense I guess for, for marae or for kainga when they're using it so that we're actually talking um, the same languages as well you know in terms of this means something to, um, to both parties when we're talking about it. Um, if we skip along to um, general themes from right across um, consultation. Um, yeah, a lot of supplies like Raupunga there, um, volunteer run supplies and um, you know costs are increasing. We talked about um, depreciation, things get more expensive over time. So how do we how do we account for that? How do we look at um, making sure that the compliance burden doesn't get out of hand and, and I guess add to that that cost burden? Uh, testing of, of water, um, yes, there there is an increased requirement um, in the in the standards, and I guess this is the the biggest leap we're making initially in terms of what monitoring is going in, uh, suppliers are putting into their supplies to make sure that the the water is safe. Um, we're, we're we're taking a, a look at that again uh, based on that feedback. Um, there's some people that didn't like the water reforms, um, so that they let us know that. Um, and um, and we get that from time to time, but um, you know we're we're the drinking water regulator. We've got the, the Water Services Act and it's really just now our responsibility to give effect to that in the way that makes sense and works for everybody. Um, some some feedback around definitions. I know there's a definition of water carrier in the in the legislation, um, but um, maybe that needs to be clarified and reticulation. We're aware of some challenges around the definition there uh, and we're working through that as well. Um, and then there was some certainty around timeframes for complying with the new requirements. So we talk uh, in the next couple of slides about, um, about some uh, specific requirements depending on whether you're registered or, or not um, but but essentially this is how long do I have if, if I'm not compliant to get my supply um, into compliance and we're still working through some of um, some of the challenges there and we'll be able to communicate that out um, to the sector uh, shortly once we've we've arrived at a, at a firm conclusion um, but the key thing is we're not expecting water supplies that aren't compliant because we've um, 
kind of move the goalposts on them to be compliant overnight and we understand that it's going to take some time and if you um, look at the example um, from Raupunga it took a number of years right and it's a continual improvement process um, to get where they currently are so um, we expect that that's going to be the same for just about every other supplier in the country as well. So if you are registered, um, there's a really important date coming up on the 15th of November um, this year, and really what we want you to do is to confirm your supply details with us. That allows us to get in touch with you uh, and allows, um, I guess, you to um, be able to access information um, and sort of start that, that conversation between us uh, about your supply. We do have a dedicated team um, and um, we have uh, also four regional officers. Um, we, we talked about uh, Peter Wood um, um, uh, engaging with Raupunga, but also um, we've got that um, that Kainga team um, that's also providing some some additional support in there as well. Um, if you're unregistered, I guess this is the important one. If you if you're not registered, and if you don't know if you're registered, then get in touch with us, and we can let you know. But if you're not registered, you've got four years to register with us, so November 2025, and then another three years to get fully compliant. So um, that's till 2028. And this was a last minute change to the Water Services Act as it emerged out of the parliamentary process, um, and that was the um, I guess the the realization that um, there are a lot of small unregistered suppliers in excess of 75,000 um, and it's going to take a long time, um, one for us to, to get in touch with them and find out where they are, um, but also um, it's going to take a significant period of time for supplies that have never been regulated or never been compliant to understand what those requirements are and then get into compliance. So um, we're really looking forward to that um, that seven years. It gives us a, an important opportunity to um, in and in a, in a chance really to get to understand um, the various parts within those 75,000 and what their needs are so that we're designing a regulatory system that works. Now we're not expecting people to, um, to sort of conform to a one size fits all approach. We've been given a, a, a pretty impressive suite of um, tools or options within the Water Services Act. Um, so it'd be, be really good for us to be able to test that out as much as possible. Um, the only other thing we're thinking about um, is additional acceptable solutions and verification methods. And these are really just ways of making the compliance burden um, as, as small as it needs to be, but making sure that we're, um, we're, we're satisfied that um, applying those, those, those compliance options still results in people receiving safe drinking water. I think that's, um, that's about all we have uh, from the consultation to, to part time. Over to you, Katie. Kia ora. Kia ora, Ray. Uh, thank you for that. Um, we haven't had any specific questions come through yet for Ray, but I'm sure that they will be coming. People will be furiously typing away. Uh, we have had uh, mostly um, really just uh, a mihi coming through um, to, to Raupunga from our um, various whanau. Uh, lots of people saying that um, what they've heard is inspirational and people are learning a lot um, from the presentation um, from Guy, Lee and Teresa. Um, what I will do is I'll just get back to um, one of our earlier slides, um, which uh, listed the number of households um, which Matua Guy spoke to. That was one of the questions that came through. So I might just quickly, please bear with me. I'm just going to go. So one of the parts I was just asking, how many houses uh, do you supply, um, Guy? And we've just got that back up on the screen. Um, one question I had, if it's all right, if I'm going to ask questions, um, Matua Guy, is the other yeah, two kohanga, are they solely reliant on your scheme? No, well, what happens is uh, we, supplied, we supplied them to their boundary, and then under a different um, um, funding regime, we would then take it from there to their tanks. If they existed, if they had existing tanks, we'd put the water into their tanks. So we kind of supplement uh, the rainwater supply. So when their tanks uh, drop to a certain level, our system, if there's no rain has come, 
uh, yeah, our system will fill their tanks. Um, that's how come in, in, in when we have more rain, we can actually sit out a longer period of time between pumping because their tanks are being supplied by, um, by rainwater. So they're not totally um, reliant on us, but um, they're very, very reliant on us, I would say, during summer. Mm -hmm. And um, those, those times during winter, our, our usage drops um, probably to two thirds to a half of what it is um, for the other six months of the year. But having said that, our usage is steadily going up. Like two years ago, it was five million litres a year. Um, last year was 8 million um, and I'm picking it'll be around about 10 million this year. So there is increasing use. Some people are, um, you know, are becoming, uh, you know, they're, they're switching to our system rather than relying on their tanks. Yeah, and I know that more and more of them are doing it because if I ever have to shut a line down for repairs or anything, I get about 10 phone calls <laughs> saying, the water's not coming. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, does that answer the question? Yeah, so it's supposed to be, a, 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 yeah, um, an additional supply for most of them, but yeah, more and more people are, are becoming heavily reliant on it. Mm -hmm. and would not make it through the year. My, my house itself has probably the biggest um, roof space apart from the marae and that's only because it used to be an old shop and a house and uh, when we didn't have a water supply I would run out of water two times a year. Yeah and that was $500 to get some you know half a tank. So yeah so hmm. I hope that answers the question. That definitely answered the question. Do you um, see more Fano um, returning back uh, to your to your rohi, to your region? I guess um, I know that there's parts of of the north or Northland where they're seeing an increase in population, and that's partly being due to people moving you back home it. in COVID times. Yeah, we've had lots of Fano returning home. Um, we've actually got Fano returning home and just plonking a batch on the land, you know. That, that's what's happening at home at the moment. But um, yeah, we've had a lot of whanau turn, um, coming home. Uh, so we had a few empty houses um, and they're actually all full again now. So they've returned to the old homesteads mm -hmm. since um, we've had the water on. Yeah, and just in the last um, week, I've put two new connections in for people who are planning to, you know, get a relocatable home and put it on on some farmer land. And the first thing they wanted was the water connected. Mm -hmm. So we've done two of those in the last week, and the last one was maybe two months ago. So you know, it's a it's a major for them. Yeah. Kia ora no, kia ora korua. Um, we've just clicked over to 7.30, so that's, um, I guess, our 60 minutes of time this evening together. Um, again, I really just um, sincerely want to thank um, uh, Lee, Guy and Teresa for joining us uh, tonight um, and for sharing your experience, all your mātauranga and um, I can tell um, by the chat and the love hearts and the smiley faces that have been coming through on Teams that people have really found this just so valuable. Um, in terms of uh, immediate next steps, um, we will uh, write up sort of a summary of the kōrero tonight and um, email that out along with a link uh, to the webinar, to the recording and to all people who have registered. And again, um, you would have seen in the chat, we posted the link um, to past webinars, but also that is where um, we will post um, upcoming webinars as well. Um, I really uh, wish you all a, a good evening. Uh, hopefully safely in your homes. Um, thank you again for joining us. Um, oh, I need to find my, my karakia slide. That's one. All right.
Mino Tata and Fakamutinga. Unu here, Unu here, Unu here, Kitty Uri Tapunui, Kiawatia, Kiamama, Tinaka, Titinana, Tiwairo, Iti Ara Tangata, Koyara, Irunga, Fakairi, Aki Kirunga, Kia Tina, Tina, Homi, Huye, Taki, Pumari, Itifano, and Stay Safe, Kia Homaru, Kakite. Kakite.